Okay. Pollen field day. We love it. Bless God. Pollen is a sign of new life. Though it's a little rough on the sign, it says, I love to see pollen. We made it through the rough time. Summertime is upon us. Beloved, with the help of the Spirit of Truth this morning, uh, I want to look at something from a whole different angle. We've had plenty of messages on, on how people talk, on how people spread messages, how people spread rumors. You know, Bible, the Bible tells us that love covers sins. And the Bible tells us that where no wood is, the fire goes out. But that's not the message this morning, but the message is still on words or on, or on the things that comes out of our mouths because there is power of life and death, so says the Word of God, in the tongue. So with the help of the Spirit of Truth, Proverbs chapter 15 is where we're going to begin this morning, beginning in verse 1. Proverbs 15, beginning in verse 1. Everybody turn there. All of you got your new fancy Bibles. You'll find those new Bibles don't drive too good. Pages stick together. I'm trying to break in a new one too. Proverbs chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach and a spirit. Help us, Father God, in the precious name of Jesus. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. You know people come to you, God sends people to you with problems, with different things going on in their lives. And God sends them to you not because he doesn't think you can handle He sends them to you expecting you to have the words to say, to have the right answer, to be able to console that person. A lot of times we get aggravated and say something that will just send them away mad. Uh, we should always take that time. You know, I said before several times, if we would just take before we would answer somebody. And I'm fast. I'm, I'm a fast talker. It's hard for me to pause, to wait. But if we will take a second to pause and wait before we speak, a lot of times we will keep ourselves out of a whole lot of trouble and keep from offending a whole lot of people. A soft answer turneth away wrath. They can be somebody just flat tore up from the floor up in your presence. And you can say just the right words in the spirit of truth and in the spirit of love and peace and soothe their soul, soothe their spirit that day, send them away. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge your eyes. It means when you know these things, when you are have wisdom, wisdom is the application of knowledge. So if the tongue of a wise man should always be speaking properly or should always be quick to to have the right things to say because if wisdom is applied knowledge if that is what makes a wise man you've got people that go to universities and that have all kinds of degrees and they're educated idiots they're not wise you can have somebody that growed up all he did was 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 whole rows of corn his whole life but the man is wise because he knows how to apply what he has learned in life to practical everyday applications. That's wisdom. Now, in the book of Ephesians, we're doing our, our normal Wednesday night study here in Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, we stopped last week, last Wednesday night, because, well, we stopped because time had, had surpassed us, but I, I want to... It's a perfect place to have stopped because the next set of passages that we start with is entering the tongue or here, or here comes the mouth because Paul is telling us what Christ had done for us. Christ gave himself up for us and offering at a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Then he goes on and tells us that fornication and uncleanness in verse 3 and, and covetous let it not once be named among, uh, among you as become a saint. So as you become child of God, when you give your lives over to the Lord, you should stop living in those lifestyles. You should start promoting things that are holy, things that are right. He says, be ye holy for he is holy. We, we should be living right and talking right. Well, he goes on in verse 4, and, and he begins really addressing what the Spirit of Truth has put it on my spirit to speak about this morning is what comes out of our mouths. 
Like I said, this is not gossip. Y'all already know what the Bible says about gossip. You already know what God thinks about those that causes strife between chief friends. There are six things that are abominations to the Lord and seven he hates. And that would be somebody that gossips. Because they're separating chief friends. They cause splinters. They cause divisions. They cause the body to fragment. That's more, that's more abominable. It's easy for church people to look at a drunkard or a drug addict and say, oh, that poor lost sinner. But they can't see little Miss Prissy sitting back there with her hair done up, going out and cutting so many people apart with her gossip that she's splitting churches up. She's not as easily recognizable to the untrained. But those that are trained and that are in the spirit and that stay prayed up and read up can spot those type of people, mark them, and avoid them. Even exclude them from your congregations, if so be the cause, if so be the case. But this is not talking about gossip. This is not talking about gossip at all. And this morning, I pray to God that, that whoever the word is for, whether it be here at Living Waters or our internet family or wherever it is, somebody, this is for, for us. There's nothing written down that is not profitable for doctrine or for teaching. He says in verse 4, Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather the giving of thanks. You know, in, in the book of Colossians, in the third chapter and the eighth verse, it says, But now also you put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. We shouldn't even be cutting jokes. They shouldn't even, if there's off-color jokes that puts anybody in a negative light or any kind of sexual innuendos or... or or anything that even cuts, and this is, I like to, I like to crack on people. I like to bust, I like to laugh at other people's expense. I'm human, who don't? And that's, I've got that kind of a sense, sense of humor. I laugh seeing other people in a tight, it, 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 if they get scared or if they get them back. Now, I don't like it done to me, but I mean, that's just the way I like, that's just the way I am. I'm just being honest. But that's not good. I, I should not jest or, or, or have any kind of foolish talking. There shouldn't be any tomfoolery coming out of our mouths. We're saints. The things that comes out of our mouths, people should be able to take us serious all the time. It's not that you can't be human. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that you can't have a lighter side because sometimes we know you've got to laugh to keep from crying. And I'm not saying that at all. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that the words that come out they shouldn't be said that, that are not convenient, but, but he says, but rather giving of thanks. And the Bible tells us that in, in all things we're a gift thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us. We should spend our times with our mouth glorifying our Father, mostly through giving thanks. Give thanks and pray unceasingly, give thanks constantly in everything that we do, whether we eat or drink or what all we do, do it all to the glory of God. So we should spend our time with the things coming out of our mouth glorifying the Father. Right? Look in Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Now remember, when Christ is, is dealing with these people here, they had just pretty much said he, they had they'd accused him of blasphemy, um, Christ, he, had, he knew their thoughts. He went on, he was telling them about kingdoms divided against themselves cannot stand. Uh, and he goes on to tell them that the real danger and the real blasphemy and the real filthiness in men are, and the real sin is not, and it, it gets back to grace and what grace is and what, sanct, what salvation is and what, and what Christ has done for you, what the cross of Calvary did for you. You've heard me say this before, but it's true. It is, it, is your, it is your position, not necessarily your practice, which guarantees you everlasting life. And, and we should all say amen to that because nobody's good enough to get there on their own. There was only one without sin. So you can definitely see it's not your practice. It's your position in Christ. It's a key phrase, in Christ. In Christ and but now should be two, two, two of the biggest phrases in the New Testament. It should be the, two of the things you love the most. I know but is not in there. You're right. I know but is not in the Bible, but but now is. 
and in Christ and in him and, in, and through him and that's the key phrase being in him being hid now the things that people do the things that we see we can look and say well that wretched sinner would the Pharisees and the Sadducees were no different they can look and he eats with unwashing hands he's defiling himself and you know you first of all let me clear this up the phrase godliness cleanliness is next godliness is not in the Bible Okay, it's right there. That the, the, another most misquoted phrase that's in the Bible is you'll know it's the end of the world by the weather. All the weather, you, is, you, that's not in the Bible either. There's a lot of things that people attribute to Scripture that are not Scripture. And, and one thing I'm going to tell you, people are quick to put their say-so and their thoughts on anything. Uh, I had a fellow tell me just the day before yesterday that, that he interprets things differently. There's only one interpreter. There's one spirit of truth. If you're not spiritually trained, that's one thing. If you don't understand or see all that is that Christ is telling you, that's one thing. But you, but a scripture does not say, do not kick a dog, and he means kick the dog. There is no way to misinterpret the scripture if the spirit of truth is inside you, right? You might not understand the scripture fully, but you cannot misinterpret the scripture because it's not for what we think or not for what we say. It's what God says is what matters. With that in mind, they... Christ goes on and, and, and tells him, he says, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. But this is where we want to look, beginning in verse 31 of Matthew 12. Christ says, Wherefore I say unto you, I say unto you that all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. It's pretty clear right there that Christ is talking about something said, something that comes out of your mouth. You remember in the beginning, the earth was, was without form and void, and the Spirit of God moved across, and he spake. Christ said in John 12, 48, that the same words that, that, I'm, that I'm preaching to you is the same words that are going to, to judge you. The, it, our existence is spoken. We're created by the Word, uh, Colossians 1.16, and we are held together, Colossians 1.17, by the Word. And it is by your words that there is power. I, I, my kids tell me all the time, I can't do this, or this is never going to happen, or that's never going to happen. Stop speaking defeat. Stop speaking negativity. This is not one of those Philly, name it, that's not what I'm talking about. But power of life and death is truly in the tongue and if you believe what you speak and if you ask it in belief it's going to come to pass you can't ask doubting you can't ask wavering and it's the same thing the things that come out at your mouth if you truly believe and if you truly don't doubt you can you are to bring your own body under subjection we walk around sick all the time because we always walk around saying oh i'm getting sick I'm getting, I, I, I'm, there's a term, there's a medical term for somebody that gets everything that, that's coming and going. They hear about it and they catch it. I, what's that term? Hypochondriac. That's it. My mama's one of them. She can hear something about on, on, on TV and two weeks later she's got it. She knows, you know what, that, I've got that. People are like that. I said, don't accept that. Don't accept that. Just because you got a headache don't mean you got a brain tumor. Just because your stomach hurts don't mean you got liver cancer. Stop speaking destruction on the bodies, the temples that the Spirit of God is housed in. We, we, are, we belong to God. Glorify God with your bodies. Are we going to live forever? No, not in this body. But why do we walk around saying such negative, defeated things all the time? Yes, the world is dark. The world is black. Praise God. I see the light. You know, people say, well, all you, all you want to do is talk about the end. The end, ain't that what we're looking for? Amen. Amen, it is. Maybe we need to change the way we're looking at it. It's not gloom and doom. It is not gloom and doom for the unbelieving world. Yes, it is going to be gloom and doom. For the believing child of God, praise Jesus. We sing songs constantly with our hands up in the air, singing about this day. He goes on in verse 34, Christ does, of Matthew chapter 12, and he says, and listen, when he calls them vipers, who's he talking about? The drug addicts, the harlots, the drunkards? He's talking to church people. 
He is. He's talking to church people. And we can learn a lot from that. You know, those that are without, you love them in. Christ is always taught that way. That's what the New Testament scriptures teach us. When you go out, you're out there and you're trying to spread love. We learned this past Wednesday, or Wednesday before, that, that, that all your ministry, anything you're going to do, evangelical-oriented, you've got to do it with love. You're not going to win no soul walking up to him and say, you sinner, you drink, you're going to die and go to hell. It's not how you want to win anybody. Those are that, those, those are, are, are tones or those are things that you use to whip the church into shape. Although the church don't like it, it's for us. Because we're to learn to be better as we Christ saves us just like you are. Right? But you ain't supposed to stay that way. You're supposed to be growing. We're supposed to be moving in the unity of the faith and our spirit's supposed to be growing. And so then, if we're truly growing, our walk is showing it and, and our talk's got to start catching up with us. Christ says, old generation of vipers, in verse 34 of Matthew 12, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For, now listen, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Beloved, this is serious. This is a serious doctrine. This is a serious teaching. This is a very serious thought. By your words, you'll be justified. By your words, you'll be condemned. We just read that whoever blasphemes speaks against the Holy Ghost. Hey, you're condemned. And Christ said that, that, that you you got to confess him before men. The Bible tells us, Paul teaches us in Romans chapter 10, that you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth. That's what the Bible says. So you do truly, it is. it does matter what you say. It does matter what you say. You've heard these, that term... Sticks and stones, my back my bones, but words will never hurt me. Words kill. There's power of life and death in words. You know, and a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold. You know how much gold is worth? A little bitty tiny piece of gold is worth six or seven hundred dollars. Can you imagine what an apple of gold would be worth? In a word fitly spoken, the Bible says it's like that. When you got a kind word for somebody, when you got a word for somebody that they need it, and I'm not talking about petty, insincere stuff that you don't mean. I'm talking about kind, true, loving words. That does more for somebody than anything you can handle them or anything you can buy them for that day or for a lifetime. You know, you can buy kids stuff their whole lives and they just want more stuff. They just become ungrateful. They just get ungrateful. They'll open up something up and kick it to the side and look for the next present. But if you tell a kid, if you talk to a kid, and if you love a child, that, that's the way they want to be shown that they love. Now, when they're, right, when they're 11, 12 years old, 6 year old, they, they may think they want to be loved by buy me this, buy me that. But that's not what they want. They want to hear from you. You should always speak love, speak those things to your children. Look in Matthew chapter 15, because Christ... Christ sums it up perfectly here. We really have to pay attention to what we say. And I, I'm not talking about running around talking, speaking like Marines. I'm talking about children of God. Always with, with, with a negative. Like if somebody asked you, how are you doing? Your response should never be, I'm, I'm making it. I'm okay. But, beloved, look, I understand that sometimes it's hard for people. And a lot of people are emotional type people. They wear their, 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 you know, if they're upset, then everybody knows it. If they're not in a good mood, then everybody knows it. shouldn't be that way with a child of God. You should be a light. You should be a light. You should a light up top where people can see it. So people are looking. So you, even if you don't feel good, or even if you're not happy, it is not our right as blood-bought children of God to reflect that on somebody else. Right? Because don't the blood, don't knowing that you've got eternal life overcome what you're going through, don't knowing that you're going to live forever overcome whatever you're going through, 
Don't knowing that God is there and never leave you and forsake you, overcome whatever it is that you're going through. Don't being a child of the Most High who's soon coming to reign, overcome whatever you're going through. So then we are never in such a mood that we should reflect it to somebody else. Even, even if you're having a bad day. It's not my right to reflect that off on somebody else. How you doing, Brother Steve? But, but, it's, but it's easy to do if you're not taking the time, taking that second to think about before you speak. Look in Matthew 15, beginning of verse 7. Christ says, you hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, this people draweth nigh unto me with what? <laughs> with the mouth. I want to give you both sides of the story because there's a walk that goes with the talk, but the talk's got to match the walk. They, they go together. He said, These people draw nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. So he said, Don't matter that you eat with unwashing hands. Don't matter that you might be eating pork. It don't matter what we deem as sin. We might see somebody drinking a glass of wine or a beer. You don't judge nobody. If they belong to Christ, that might not be sin to them. And that's not what's defiling that person. It's what comes from within is what defiles that person. It's what Christ said. Because when it goes in, where does it come out? The drought. It don't go into the heart. It don't go into the heart. It's the things that are in the heart that defile somebody. Look what he says. Then came his disciples in verse 12 and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Notice that. He said, the disciples come to him and said, Hey, Rabbi, you've made these people mad. You've offended them by the words that you spoke. Did Christ say, Well, I'm sorry. Go in there and tell them all I'm sorry, and I'm going to apologize and pat them all on the head. He said, no, he said, every, every plant that my father didn't plant shall be rooted up. Christ said, let the chips fall where they may. That's what he said. Christ said, I apologize beforehand that I can't apologize for what I'm saying. Right? Praise God. So every plant, he didn't say go in there and make them feel better. Well, I'm sorry. Bring them in here so I can tell them I'm sorry I offended them. Truth offends those that don't like truth. Somebody that likes the truth. You know, that's why the Bible says reprove a scorner or a martyr. You, you'll receive a blot, a mark. You know, I, I worry about that a lot. Like, well, why? But you rebuke or reprove some, someone that is a child or someone that's loved, they'll love you for it. It's because they will literally, they will hate your guts if you say something that, defends them, that offends them because the love of Christ is not in them. They don't understand it. They think they're churched because they've been to church their whole life. They think religion has took more people to hell than any single thing I can think of. False religions mostly, but religion. That's what Christ called them vipers. Then he, then, then he goes on, Christ says, verse 14, Let them alone, he says, they be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. So you can't say, well, I didn't know. Or, well, hey, I went to the Catholic church. and No, no, no. If the blind leads the blind, both are falling into the ditch. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare unto us this parable. And Jesus said, Are you also yet without understanding? Because Peter didn't understand what it was that Jesus just told him. Do you not yet understand, verse 17, that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the draw? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashing hands defileth not a man. So it's the things that is on our insides that makes us defiled. Because remember, from, from the treasure of the heart, a good or an evil man, whatever's in your heart, whatever your treasure is, whatever your heart is focused on, that's your treasure. So when people come out and they speak vile things, they speak 
wicked, evil thoughts. That's what's in their heart is wicked, evil thoughts. It's one thing for somebody to say something. I'm not talking about somebody that might mash their, their thumb with a hammer when they're framing up their porch. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the things that comes out of people's. They may walk better than we walk. They may act better than we act. They may be doing more than we do to help somebody else. But remember what Christ, what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, if it's done without love, it's in vain. It's in vain. Had a, had a brother once, well, I, I'm not his brother no more. I, I, I broke fellowship with him. I still love him, still, still do uh, work for him. But he told me one time that his next door neighbor, that, that, that his next door neighbor had lived in a trailer and it burnt down. And he was glad they were gone. And uh, I asked him one time, well, what was the man a believer? What was the man, did, did you ever, uh, no, nah, I, I never, uh, I never, I never fooled with them. They, they were, uh, they were trash. I never, uh, I never, in other words, he, he deemed them unworthy to hear the gospel is what he was telling me. And that, that is uglier. And that is worse to me than if I, if I had to find someone on the side of the road that couldn't walk because they were drunk and I had to help them into my house. That person that deems somebody else unworthy to hear the gospel and is so self-righteous and high as mighty and that comes out of their mouth, that's truly what's on the inside of them, that's more defiled than that drunkard was to me. I broke fellowship over that because it, that, that is serious. That is, a, is a, uh, something that is wrong on the inside. The drunkard, he can be cured of his drunkenness. They still, he was still tender-hearted, but the old boy that was supposedly in his church and goes to church, one of them holy rollers, if you will, that was a cruel statement to say. They're not worthy. That's what he said. They're not worthy of sacrifice. Christ came for those. Christ came to save sinners. He came for people just like us. We, we, we have no right to say anybody doesn't have a, shouldn't have an opportunity to hear the gospel. So this man was his neighbor for years and he never not once told him or showed him the love of Christ. And when his trailer was burnt and gone, he was glad because the white trash had moved out. That's the way I felt. Things have never been the same since then. James chapter 3, with, with him and I. James chapter 3. You got a lot of people that want to speak you got a lot of people that want to be heard. I'm telling you what, <laughs> sometimes it's better if you don't and if you weren't, if you don't speak and if you weren't heard, because there's no way. Well, we we fix to read it right now. There, there's no way that you can please that. What is going on with that thing this morning? There's no way that you can please everybody. There's no way that you can say the right things for everybody. It's amazing, though, how many people will get mad if you don't cater to their emotional needs or thoughts or whatever it is. Look, if you, if nobody offends anybody, you're a perfect man with fixing to read. Boy, the devil hates love. The devil hates this message because I've never heard that buzzer go like that. That means we're going to keep people's attention and people's going to hear this, right? I don't see nobody going to sleep. Praise God. So that thing's working to our advantage this morning. James chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, says, My brother, be not many masters, which he's talking about teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. If any man offends not in word. Well, that means if you've never said anything to offend somebody, if you, ne if you don't go around, if you can control your tongue, you can handle your whole body. That's true. That is true. Verse 3 says, Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about the whole body. And behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. There has never been a war fought in the history of mankind that didn't start in somebody's mouth. I promise you. I promise you. There has never been a war fought. The Bible tells us that strife 
or actually pride, which is the root cause of every division and every schism, breaks down to pride. And that pride has to come from somebody's mouth. Did you hear this? Did you hear that? Did you hear what they... It, look, listen, blood. We, we know, I said it wasn't about God, but it's not. But y'all should know already. And if anybody comes up to you speaking that, did you hear what she, stop them there. Say, look, look, I don't want to hear all that stuff. I got enough problems of my own. I don't need to hear about other people's business. You know what I mean? Because there is people think that they're doing God's business by spreading other people's business. Okay? Now, what you can do openly to everybody is love from within, love from out your mouth. The tongue is a fire, it says in verse 6, a world of iniquity, a whole world of sin. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body. So what is the one thing in you, on you, that can defile your whole body? Your tongue, our mouths, what comes out. We went and think about that. With that being said, the tongue is the most powerful weapon you got on your body. So instead of using that to disadvantage, we should be using it more advantageous. So it's just, just as bad as it can be used detrimentally to us, then it can be used to magnify the glory of Christ exponentially, right? We can use our tongues the same way for, for either way. But it's really whatever's inside, that's what's going to come out. You ever hear somebody say, all they do is talk about Jesus. Well, praise God. That's a good sign. Good sign. If somebody wants to talk about Jesus, their Savior, all day long, or somebody wants to, you know, fellowship and talk about Godly things are things that that means that's what's in their heart. That's what's in their heart. I'm kind of more concerned about those that never do. Right? It's easy for them to shut up and not cuss for a few hours while you're around them. But it's what they don't say sometimes. That's just as bad. Every kind of beast, verse 7, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. For it is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Out of the same mouth we'll say, Here I am to worship. And then we'll go outside and say, Idiot. Why do we do those things? We shouldn't do those things. It shouldn't happen. I, out of our same mouth, we'll say, yeah, I, I confess Christ, and I'm so happy that Jesus loves me, and he chose me. And, and then you can, you'll can, you go right out, and you'll never believe what such and such said. It shouldn't be like that. We can use our mouth. We can use the power that's in our voice. And you know what? It, you know, I'm going to tell you the resistance to, to the evil. It's truth. Resistance to the darkness is light. You fight dark with light. The way that you expose light on the dark is through the truth. It's through truth. So our weapon is truth. As long as you remain silent, you are conceding to the darkness. Because he who knoweth to do it right, and he do it not to him, it's sin. But when you're getting in the gap, and you're being heard, and you're getting the warnings, and you're getting the message out there, beloved, you're being light, and you're lighting the darkness. Your words can be, your words can have more power than any weapon formed on planet earth the uh verse 11 says does the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter water what's the answer to that you go up to a creek and it be both bitter and sweet no no can the fig tree my brethren bear olive berries either a vine figs so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh so if the ocean, you don't go, you can't drink out of the ocean as you're turning to Proverbs. If you can't turn out, if you know the ocean does not have salt water and fresh water, then why in the world does our mouth both have love and cursings in them? Why does our mouth both have, we praise you, Jesus, but I can't stand such and such? Do you see what I'm saying? And if we focus our efforts, if we focus what is inside us on exercise. I understand a lot of people are not speakers. I got this dear brother of ours. We love him to death. We, we talk about him all the time. He calls every now and then. He's not real good physically. 
He always thinks he's not good enough, and he's not good enough. Nobody's good enough, but Christ he is. But you know, one of his main things is he, he can't pray out loud, he says. I can't pray out loud. I've actually had people say they wouldn't come to church because I would ask people to pray, and they're afraid they're going to get called on to pray. Well, that's insanity to me, but, but I, can, I can't never see that. But I've never been backwards, you know. I mean, so I, I can, some people are. Some people are. But you know, even if you say a few words, it's what those words are is what makes the difference. And actually, the Bible tells us that if a man keeps his mouth shut and only speaks a few words, you can be a complete idiot, but people think you're wise. So the last words you say sometimes probably the, the better off you may look because you seem intelligent. But the words that you should say, if there are a few, make them count. Make them count. Make them be words to edification to the body and to those that are lost. Even a fool, verse 28 of, of Proverbs 17 says, even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. And he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. That was scripture for what I just said in layman's term. You keep your mouth shut, you can be a blooming idiot. People think you're wise. The more, you know, the empty can rattles the most. The, the, the quieter somebody is sometimes, the more intelligent they seem. But we have not been given the ministry of loose lips. Now that we've been given the ministry of silence, we've been given the ministry of proclamation, proclaiming, which is something done with the mouth, the good news of Christ. And what you can do for somebody, you can help people with their bills, you can help people with their financial problems, but the best way you can help somebody is with sound advice, counsel, words of truth, which come only from the Word of God, which come only through the Spirit of truth residing in you. A kind word, a kind word. Verse 21 of chapter 18, the book of Proverbs says that death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So if you want to be sick, if you don't want to not be able to do anything, keep telling yourself, I can't do this. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't. I can't. I can't. Those are two words I loathe more than anything on planet Earth. I can't. I can't. What do you mean you can't? Sure you can. It is, it's, if you want, they that love it will eat the fruit thereof. You heard of the little train that could? Everybody knows the little train that could. He did, didn't he? They didn't write a children's book on the little train that, that, that didn't. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. And he could. It's the same way, beloved. It's what you speak. You love it, you're going to eat the fruit thereof. You want to speak sickness on your body, you're going to be sick all the time. You want to speak negativity in your household, you're going to have bad responses. If you want to speak positive and speak love and speak peace, those things will follow. Is it hard? Sure. I'm not saying you just put Shazam, everybody walks out of here and you're eloquent speakers and you never say the wrong thing again, but that's why we have the Lord to help us in time of need. That's why we call on him. Proverbs 13. Well, it's very important to watch what we say. It's very important to, to speak the things that we should say. And even though we should watch what we say, we should never be silent. He's not talking about keeping your mouth shut and never saying anything. We, we, we're supposed to talk one to another. And we're supposed to edify one another. And the way you do that is through words that you say in love and in truth. Hopefully, Proverbs 13, verse 3 says, He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life, but he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. Now there, he's not talking about staying shut up. He's talking about people that flap of their gums. Because you're going to eat the fruit of your labor one way or the other. If you show, if you sow strife and discord and hatred, strife, discord and hatred's coming back to you. If you sow peace and love and unity, peace and love and unity is going to find you. Where, whatever field you spend your time laboring in is going to be the field that grows the best. We've, we've talked about it a hundred times before. It's 
wherever, whatever your mind is going, wherever your head is, whatever your heart, your mind is focused on, your ability to think, that, that's, that's your God. And whichever way you get your head going is the way your body is going to follow. And if you can get your head wrapped around the idea of taking a second to pause as we're turning to Ecclesiastes 5. Take a second, which is just a couple books over up next, right over from Proverbs. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. If we take us just a second to think about something before we say it, we will never, never have to worry about doing or saying the wrong thing. And I think these are closing scriptures. We... There's a fine line. There, there, there's a fine line between talking too much to being stuck to, to, to not saying enough. There's a fine line with being uh, o- over anxious or, or flirtatious or stuck up. There, there's titles and lines we put on everything. All we have to know that if what we're doing, we're doing sincerely in our hearts to serve our king, regardless of whether somebody, the way they may come across to them, Sometimes we have a hard time explaining how we feel. Or, or that's not, it come out not what I meant. Y'all have heard me say it all the time, jokingly, laughingly. Hear what I mean, not what I say, because sometimes I have a hard time putting into words what it is that I'm trying to say. But if we, if we know in our hearts and we pray and ask for help each morning as we're asking for everything else, if we're asking for the ability to use our tongue right today, to not say anything that would hurt or offend maliciously. You can speak the truth and hurt and offend because the wicked people don't like truth. So don't ask not to speak, not to hurt. Don't, don't ask. Be careful what you ask for. But ask that you can be used for love and to edify Christ and to give God glory this day. Give me a platform to speak on your behalf. And you know what? Those platforms are there every single day. They're at the drive through windows. They're at Walmart. They're everywhere we go and we don't take advantage of it. This pe- these people need to hear the warnings. The warnings come via words. They need to hear the message of the gospel of the grace of Christ Jesus. That message comes through word. You have to speak up. But then at the same time, beginning in verse 1 of Ecclesiastes 5, keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. What sacrifice of fools? Flapping your guns. Yeah. And he says, for they consider not that they do evil. We sit around and talk. We flap off our guns talking crazy stuff and don't realize that we're doing evil. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. You see those people that like to be heard, those that make long prayer, that stand in the marketplace with their phylacteries and large, and they like to make long prayer unto God. The Bible said you're on earth, God's in heaven, keep your words few. Approach God by all means and pray to God on everything that, that you want to pray to him but when you are in a public place or when you're in a public forum like this you ain't there is no perfect prayer you ain't God if I call on you to pray say Father God thank you for this day we love you in Jesus name that's a prayer there is no written down book of prayers that you say but the pretentious ones the fake ones the repetitive ones those are vanity and those you should keep to a minimum Right? And God knows who he is. You don't have to say, God, and, you know, and we pray this day in God, and, I, and I'm coming to you in God. And He knows who he is. You don't have to address him. Have you heard people pray like that too? Oh, and dear God, and oh, and dear God. And, and, and it's almost like it's a performance. He knows his name. And once you have addressed him, beloved, you've got his attention. You've got his attention without addressing him. He's watching you right now. He knows the thoughts and the intents of your heart. You can send up a prayer in your head right now. Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for this word. Help me not say the wrong things. Be not rash when your mouth and and, uh, let your words be few. Verse 3 says, For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. Ooh. Right? And they can't never shut up. They'll never shut up. Tell everything they know. Tell everything they know. 
You ever hear them people and they say, if you don't want your business told, don't tell them? You should avoid them people. You should avoid them people. Verse 4, when thou vowest to vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Look at this. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? For in the multitude of dreams and many words there are also diverse vanities. But fear thou God. A lot of people got dreams, he said. A lot of people's got a lot of dreams. There's a lot of words. And in the multitudes of words... And in everything, everybody's got to put their two cents in it. Everybody's got their dreams and their visions. Vanity. Fear God. Fear God. Trust God. Get your directions and instructions from the Word, not from somebody's dreams and visions. And say the things that edify. Remember this. Christ is into multiplication and addition. Anything to edify the body is what the Spirit of Truth would have you do. The Spirit of Truth does not glorify Himself. The Spirit of Truth glorifies Christ. That's what Christ... Go to John 16. I told you this last scripture. I've got to share this one thing with you. John 16. We'll close here. Please, beloved. Think before you speak. But by all means... Speak. When God puts something on your spirit, if it is something that is good for somebody, something pleasant, something fitting, something to help that person, you know it's from God because all good things comes down from the Father which is in heaven, with whom is no variableness, neither shall I turn. All good things. These are bad things. Don't. If it's anything that's going to hurt somebody, it's going to do somebody harm, it ain't from God. No matter how bad you're itching to get it out, it ain't from God. If it's not, then you heard your mama say this one thing mama say, the mama quotes that I like. You ain't got nothing good to say, shut up. Keep your mouth shut. That was That's a good one. Because if what you're about to say is not for edifying, don't say it. Keep it to yourself. If somebody asks you your opinion, just because somebody asks your opinion don't mean you got to give it. No comment. I, I, I ain't getting up into that Tom Fuller. I ain't going to answer a fool according to his father. You ain't got to comment just because somebody asked you a question about something. We so want to daggone be interactive. The spirit of truth will guide you in all truth. He will testify and he'll glorify Christ. He will not glorify of himself. He is not going to be coming through dreams and visions telling you things. He's going to take of the things that Christ has told you and he's going to teach you them. Beginning in verse 12. I have yet, Christ says, I have yet many things to say unto you but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. That's why we always ask the Father for the spirit of truth to teach us. Because he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he shall show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he will receive of mine and show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he, the spirit of truth, shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. So the main mission of the spirit of truth, yes, you're going to be sealed to the day of your redemption of your body. But the main object for the spirit of truth in this day is to teach us through the scriptures and it's to glorify Christ Jesus. So you got churches preaching the Holy Ghost. The message is the cross of Christ. Okay, you don't blaspheme the Holy Ghost, amen, because the Holy Ghost is who's teaching you. So if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you lose your ability to learn, to understand unto salvation, to learn, to, to be wise unto salvation. That's where that condemnation comes from. The message is Christ crucified for our sins as a substitutionary death for a sinner like me. And for all who put their trust in him, believe in their hearts and confess with our mouth, we'll be saved will be saved. Be careful what you say, but by all means, beloved, say something. Questions? Comments?